which is really nice. Uh, so welcome everyone to this afternoon's book round table. Uh, we'll be discussing Professor Charter Swing's latest book, The Moderate Bolshevik, uh, Mikhail Tomsky, From the Factory to the Kremlin, 1880 uh, to 1936. My name is Diana Heredia. I am the Institute for Historical Studies uh, graduate assistant. and I'm acting in capacity of moderator today. <laughs> Uh, so I'll introduce very briefly uh, our panelists for today, and then we can just start rolling with the conversation. So we'll start uh, from uh, left to right. Sorry, right to left, I guess. Um, sorry. Um, uh, so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I thought I had a message from Courtney. Yeah. So um, so H. W. Brandt, uh, built to his friends, uh, holds the Jack S. Blanton uh, Senior Chair. Uh, in the in history here at UC Austin. His most recent book is The Last Campaign, Sherman, Jeronimo, and the War for America. Uh, and then with us too is uh, Professor Judy Coffin. She's professor of history. Her book, Sex, Love, and Letters, Writing Simone de Beauvoir, is translated into French, uh, is being translated into French, sorry, and will be out in September with Edition Pong. Uh, then with us too is uh, David F. Crew, who is Distinguished Teaching Professor of History, uh, also here at UT Austin. His most recent book, Bodies and Ruins, Imagining the Bombing of Germany, 1945 to the Present, was published in 2017. He is currently working on a book with the title, Disturbing Images, Photographing Hitler's Third Reich, uh, Third Reich uh, 1933 to 1945. And the author of today's uh, book and discussion is Charters Wien, who is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Franz Dinius Normandy Scholar Program on World War II, who many of us, of course, are <laughs> very well acquainted with. Uh, he has been awarded numerous awards at, U at the University of Texas, including the President's Associates Teaching Excellence Award, the American Historical Association awarded uh, Professor Wynn's book, Workers, Scribes, and Pogrom, The Donbass Bend in Late Imperial Russia, 1870 to 1905, the Herbert Baxter Adams Press. The attempted seizure of Donbass in 2040 by Putin's Russia and the invasion of Ukraine in 22 uh, sparked renewed interest in the book. So, oh, thank you, Diane. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, giving you an overview of the book. Um, and uh, then we'll open up to conversations. Um, good. And, and thanks to, to Bill, um, Judy, and David for agreeing to be commentators. Um, though their expertise is far from Soviet history, um, I look forward to hearing what they have to say. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, China's, uh, Judy changed her family name to Judy Kotke. <laughs> 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 well, let me begin by stating that virtually nothing was known about Tom, Mikhail Tomsky until the publication of my book and some earlier articles. And I was a student in the back over here who took my graduate course on Revolutionary Russia last semester and knew the first 13 books. I, was it even mentioned? Barely. Barely. So, um, so historians have focused almost exclusively on Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, and to a lesser extent, Bukharin. <clears throat> but the pragmatic and charismatic Tomsky, the only proletarian member of the Politburo and head of the huge trade union bureaucracy, played a critical role in literally all the most important developments during the transition from Tsarism and Stalinism. <clears throat> to my delighted surprise, one of the leading historians of Soviet Russia recently wrote in his review for the Russian Review that my biography demonstrated that Tomsky was a, as important historically as Trotsky. Although I never made such a claim, it seems I achieved my first goal from the book, which was establishing Tomsky's significance. So who was Tomsky? First thing to appreciate is he rose from an impoverished youth and, and raised by a single mother who had left her drunkard of a husband. As a result of this poverty, the future leader of the Soviet Union never had more than three years of elementary school education. He began work in St. Petersburg factories at, at the tender age of 12. 
<clears throat> but Tomsky's remarkable self-confidence and gifts as a public speaker, speaker distinguish him from fellow Bolsheviks in working class backgrounds. Once in the top ranks of the party leadership, after enduring nine years, suffering in prison and Siberian exile for his activities in the revolutionary underground, Tomsky did not shy away from challenging other party leaders, including even Lenin during the 1917 revolution. Tomsky primarily had two res responsibilities during the 1920s. First, as a key member of the governmental leadership that was trying to build a modern industrial economy. And second, as head of the institution responsible for protecting workers' interests. This meant that Tomsky's career was inevitably a stormy as well as central one. Holding these two positions simultaneously put Tomsky in the middle of the acrimonious debates um, that preoccupied early Soviet leaders. Tomsky was a skilled politician whose delicate balancing act juggling these two responsibilities proved surprisingly successful initially. But in 1921, the party leadership stripped Tomsky of his position as chair of the Central Council of the Trade Unions. His political rise seemed to have been abruptly cut short. Tomsky's removal came on the heels of the so-called trade union debate, <clears throat> an extraordinary, unprecedented debate over the role of trade unions in a self-proclaimed worker state. Most notably, Tomsky opposed Trotsky's proposal to militarize labor into so-called labor armies. This was the beginning of the deep antipathy Tomsky felt toward Trotsky. But Tomsky's efforts to placate the, those trade unionists more militant than himself outraged members of the political leadership especially Lenin. Lenin sent Tomsky packing to sent off to Central Asia in 1921 on what the party leadership considered a critical mission. Tomsky had been appointed to chair the leading governmental body in the region, even though he obviously knew little, if anything, about the Turco-Islamic world. Tomsky quickly found himself trying to rein in one of the party's most violent fanatics, who was Lenin's backing, brutally persecuted Russian settlers in the region effort to win over the uh, indigenous nomadic population. The party leadership eventually took Tomsky's side and brought him back to Moscow. Almost unbelievably, given his recent disgraced exile to Tashkent in 1922, in 1922, Tomsky was selected over Lenin's objection to be one of the first, uh, to be one of the just seven members of the, on the Politburo. Since the Politburo was already <laughs> the center of political power in the Soviet Union, <laughs> this made Tomsky one of the seven most powerful figures in the country. Tomsky proved to be a modern Bolshevik in international as well as domestic affairs. He orchestrated one of the Soviet Union's few foreign policy achievements during the 1920s. Over Tomsky's strong objections, over, excuse me, over Trotsky's strong obje objections, Tomsky succeeded in temporarily linking British and Soviet trade unions together. Tomsky achieved the success by charming British trade unionists while holding his hardline critics such as Trotsky at bay um, in Moscow. Throughout the 1920s, Tomsky fought to increase the trade union's considerable autonomy while maintaining their position as one of the major pillars of the regime. He embraced the moderate economic policies of the 1920s are known by their, their acronym NEP as the best path to re revive the economy after its collapse during seven years of war, revolution, and civil war. By 1927, economic output exceeded pre-war levels and workers enjoyed a standard of living higher than ever before. Tomsky represented all those workers who were more concerned with improving immediate conditions than pursuing, as Trotsky and others advocated, a radical economic program to transform Soviet Russia overnight. This is a sympathetic, but not uncritical biography. In contrast to all these elements of moderation, Tomsky proved to be a zealous participant in the power struggle following Lenin's strokes in, early 1920, in the early 1920s. <clears throat> he could be far from moderate during this political and fighting towards those with whom he most strongly disagreed, especially those he thought threatened to, to abandon the moderate economic policies of NEP. Tomsky worked arm in arm with Stalin and other leaders to crush the Trotsky-led opposition. It was Tomsky's condemnation of Trotsky's policies and his dislike of Trotsky's haughty personality that would largely explain his role during the power struggle, particularly his alliance with Stalin. 
Chomsky's harsh attacks when he was on top against the opponents of his policies and against the tactics that he used would make it difficult for him and his modern associates to mount effective opposition and Stalin tr suddenly turned against them. Stalin's sudden adoption of coercive measures against the peasantry in early 1928 convinced Tomsky that Stalin posed an existential threat to the balanced economic policies of the 1920s. In mid-1928, Stalin considered the trade unions a major obstacle to his plans to push forward with forced collectivization and breakneck industrialization. The animosity between Tomsky and Stalin grew increasingly bitter. Tomsky angrily protested that Stalin's radical policies would exploit workers and peasants. He warned Stalin that workers would resist the inevitable deterioration in their standard of living. A drunken Tomsky even whispered into Stalin's ear at a family gathering that workers would kill him, would try to kill him. The final showdown between the Stalinists and the trade union leadership occurred on Tomsky's home turf, the 8th Trade Union Congress in December 1928. But the decisive vote undermining Tomsky's leadership of the trade unions took place behind closed doors, where Tomsky's attempts to block Stalin from inserting his supporters onto the Central Trade Union Council failed by only the thinnest of margins. Stalin's political victory spelled doom for Tomsky, for trade union autonomy, and for the promise of gradually raising wages and, and and increasing uh, consumption. While Tomsky continued to hold a position of responsibility following his political defeat in 1929, principally as head of the huge trade, uh, huge Soviet publishing industry, again, again somebody with three years of, of education, um, um, but it, it Stalin's continually hounded him. Tomsky initially demonstrated considerable fortitude in the face of these attacks, continued to meet secretly with the opposition fellow other oppositionists, but the campaign vilifying him took a horrible toll on both his mental and physical health. Some of the strength <laughs> now still incapacitated him that, um, that he received months of medical care in Germany. In 1936, realizing he'd be forced to undergo a humiliating show trial and avoid the kind of interrogations that y'all are familiar with uh, from Dr. Sun Yun, um, uh, Tomsky took his own life at age 56. If by committing suicide, he thought he, was, he, would, um, he could save his family, he was horribly wrong. In the great purges that subsequently swept over the country, the political police executed his, his two oldest sons and sent his wife and youngest son off to the gulag. The political police also arrested virtually everyone who had ever been associated with Tomsky in the trade unions and the publishing industry. So I will conclude my opening comments with just a few words about the failure of, of Tomsky and the trade unions to prevent the Stalinist outcome of the Russian Revolution. The hardships and suffering that accompanied Stalinist economic policies, as well as the brutal terror that followed, could have been prevented if, if Tomsky and moderates within the party leadership had been able to block Stalin's and his supporters' drive to power. While well, historians from various perspectives have argued that the Stalinist outcome was all but inevitable, Stalin's victory over the so called Rightists, as Tomsky would be labeled, was far more contingent than that. Many contemporaries expected the more modern Bolsheviks to prevail. It was even widely rumored that Tomsky might replace Stalin as the leader of the party. While Tomsky did fight um, the Stalinists behind closed doors, he and his allies steadfastly refused to make their opposition public and appeal for mass support because of their misguided belief in the ne necessity of preserving party unity. While Tomsky was relatively moderate, his devotion to Bolshevik discipline, tragically, meant he was not able to mount effective resistance to the Stalinist project. So that concludes my opening. <laughs> so yeah, I think the original orders proposed was uh, from broader to yes. Okay, okay. so I'm reading the most now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alphabetical, let's call it. All right. Right. So I will go first because I think I know the least about <laughs> Russian history, but I will employ the old academic trick. When you are faced with a question that you are uncomfortable with or don't know how to answer, broaden the question. And then you can bring it in, bring in lots of other stuff. So I'm going to start with a comment that was made on one of the pages of the introduction of the book about 
Well, alluding to the, the low esteem in which the genre of biography has often been held in the academic world. And I want to talk about this as someone who has committed biography myself. And more than one. More than one. More than one. And, and I have been cured. So I really want to talk about what I found to be, and I, I actually would like to hear from Charles, what he's what he encountered and, and what of what I'm saying echoes with him. So there's a reason that academics tend to look down on biography. Actually, there are a number of reasons. One reason is that biographies tend to be written about important people, about famous people. And there's a very good reason for this, because we historians are all prisoners of our sources. And it is possible to write about famous people precisely because they are famous. People who wrote, received letters from them saved the letters. People who encountered them wrote down their recollections of what it was like. Eventually, people would save their collections. They would build museums to them. And so you can document the actions, the lives of important people. You can also write biographies. You can write the life stories of ordinary people, but only in extraordinary times. So it's easy to write about ordinary people during the Civil War, the American Civil War, because nearly everybody who went off to war realized this is the biggest thing I will ever be part of. And for many of them, it was the first, maybe the only time they'd ever been away from home. Again, we historians are prisoners of our sources. If somebody just speaks to somebody else in the year 1863, it's lost. But if somebody is apart from that loved one, let's say, a man goes off to war and he writes to his wife or he writes to his children. The letter is a concrete evidence of what he's thinking, what he's saying. And because this is a big deal, because the Civil War is important, people will save that letter. And the letter will eventually find its way into an archive or a library. I encountered this. I wrote a book on the California gold rush. And I encountered all sorts of people who were, and this is no, with no disrespect to them, were nobodies before they left for California. And they were just ordinary people and they lived their lives with all the people they knew right around them. They never wrote any letters. They went off to California. And they started writing letters or keeping journals because they knew that the people at home would want to know first that they were alive and secondly, how they were doing. And so once they head out to California, I'm able to write about them. While they're in California, I can write about them. Most of them eventually went home. So they pop up on the radar screen for this one moment, this extended moment, and then they disappear off the radar screen. So I can write about them during this period. So my rule of thumb is, you can write about extraordinary people in ordinary times, famous people, because you can talk about them from birth to death. If you're a king, if you turn out to be a president, something like that. You can write about ordinary people in extraordinary times, like the Civil War, the California Coast, perhaps the Russian Revolution. We can talk about that. But it's really hard to write about ordinary people in ordinary times because they leave relatively little trace. So they're has been a concern among academic historians in particular that too often in the past, historians have written about just the same famous people and we should write about ordinary people. But it's really hard to write about ordinary people for the reasons that I've said. So that's one of the challenges. There's another aspect. And from the looks of you, most of you are undergraduates here. Well, maybe one day you will find yourself in a meeting of a history department where somebody is talking about the dissertation they just wrote. And maybe they're applying for a job, so they're giving their job title. Now, most of the people in the room will not be intrinsically interested in the subject of the dissertation, but they show up because maybe this is somebody we're gonna hire. But what they wanna know is, what does your dissertation mean for me? What can I take away from it? And they might not wanna know, for example, they might not really care about it. The details of the life of Mikhail Tomsky, something like that. But what they will want to know is, did you use any new avenues of methodology? Are there tools that you can use? Did you come across any archives? Did you contribute? Do you have any, do you have any new interpretation? Do you have any theoretical advances? Can I take your work and apply it to my work? The problem with 
biographies is there's not a lot of theory in biography. There's not a lot of methodological innovation in biography. It's probably the oldest genre of history. And then there's a third element, and this is why it doesn't lend itself to theory at all. So theory, social science theories, require sort of multiple instances of something. If your n equals one, then you can't extrapolate from that at all. And so it might be really interesting to know about Tomsky, but what does it tell us about anybody else? And this is the problem for the academics who, well, we in the social, I'll call it humanities, but humanities history is close to social science. All of those, all of us are afflicted with a kind of physics envy where in physics, they make, they have real theories and then you can test these and actually have laws. Well, we don't have anything like that, but because the physicists have had such power and such, such success in changing the world, we sort of like to think we do too. There was a time when people thought, historians thought we could come up with theories and laws of history. Those have sort of faded away because humans are really difficult to model. So all, for all those reasons, academics have tended to either look away from or look down on biography. So first of all, I applaud charter, charters for taking this on because in the academic world, it's you have to work a little bit harder to get recognition for a good biography. But then, but then, so why does biography survive? Well, it doesn't do that well in the academy but it survives because people are interested in people. Now, most of you are, maybe most of you are history majors, you like history, you can't, you didn't have to come to this, this is history class. So I'm not talking about you. I bet that a lot of you had a good high school history class. Maybe you had an AP history class or you're an ID class or, or something like this. But a lot of people have a bad experience of history in high school. And that's because I used this line in a number of occasions before, but a lot of people cannot remember the last name of their high school history teacher, but they do remember that the first name was Coach. <laughs> and, and this is, you know, what happens. It's, I've been a high school teacher. I've been a high school history teacher and a high school math teacher. And I know that no principal would put somebody who didn't know something about mathematics into a math class. <laughs> but they put plenty of people who don't know anything about history in the history class. And so history, as a lot of people remember their last exposure to it in high school, was it was you have to memorize a bunch of dates and names and maybe you match this and that. And it was just as boring as could be. But nobody has a bad recollection of a high school biography class because nobody took a biography class. And furthermore, biography, biography is the closest genre of nonfiction to novels, because novels are all about getting in the heads of people, learning what makes somebody tick, and that's exactly what biographers do. So biography remains popular outside the academy for very good reasons. And so for myself, one of the reasons that I was drawn to writing biography was, well, first of all, that's what attracted me to history in the first place. But secondly, I thought, maybe I'd get more readers if I called these things biography. So I had this great idea. I was gonna write a history of the United States in six volumes. And I presented the idea, this is when I was young and ambitious. I presented the idea to a publisher who just laughed in my face. A six volume history of the United States. <laughs> this is one. Who do you think you are, Will Durant? Okay, Will Durant means nothing. <laughs> yes, right. There you go. Okay. Some of you will recognize Will Durant. So Will Durant wrote an 11, what was it, 12, 15 volumes, The Story of Civilization from start to finish, from start to the present. And the, the answer I was supposed to give was no, no, but my real silent answer was, yeah, that's exactly, I read the story of civilization, loved it. So I thought, I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do it under false pretenses. I'm not gonna say this is a history of the United States in six volumes. I'm gonna write six biographies that cover the field of American history. So I did, and I enjoyed doing it, but by the end, and I, oh, I'd like to see your reaction to this too. By the end, I kind of realized that there's a fundamental problem with biography. And it, it's a little bit of that, that academic complaint about biography. When you write a biography, you cannot help 
contributing the impression that the world revolves around your person. And your person doesn't even have to be a famous person. Now, the people that I wrote about were mostly the presidents of the United States. Perhaps, arguably, in, in many cases, the most powerful person in the world. But the world does not revolve around even a president of the United States. But you write a biography. Your subject is pretty much there on every page. And you can't get away from it, unless you're Robert Taylor. And then you can write 100 pages on the history of the U.S. Senate. Never even mention Lyndon Johnson. And his five volumes or six or however many volumes it's going to be on Lyndon Johnson. So... So I, I realized that I was contributing to this impression that the world revolves around these important individuals. And so I was kind of back where I started. So I've been cured of biography for the time being. <laughs> I've, what I've done is instead of writing biographies, now I write the equivalent of plays. And I call them plays because instead of one person, I have two people involved. <laughs> so I wrote about Harry Truman and Douglas MacArthur. But it's really good. Because you don't just look from your subject out. You have somebody, often, in a couple of cases, your subject's worst enemy. And you get these two points of view. And if you set it up right, then they can actually talk to each other. One of the things that characterizes novels, just as a genre, is there's lots of dialogue. People talk. In most history books, people don't talk much. They might write a letter occasionally. But then the letter, the other recipient doesn't write right back. But if you have sort of these dual biographies, then they can talk to each other. And it's just like, it's just like a novel. So I'd be interested to hear what your reflection on is now having committed biography. But will you do it again? <laughs> well, do we, do we the um, format? Of, I think we go first through well, all the... No, or whatever you, 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 you can say something about what else. Sure. Yeah. Well, first thing <clears throat> I want to say is this, this was especially challenging because there were no letters. Yeah, exactly. How'd you do it? Um, <laughs> I, it, it took so long, embarrassingly long, partly because I kept on hoping that the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, the archives in Moscow, the party archives would open up to the extent that there would be more in Tomsky's file than there was. There were no personal letters, there was almost nothing. I suspect that when he was arrested in 1930, or when he committed suicide and then his family was arrested, they confiscated all of his papers. And unlike for other prominent figures, they are still sitting somewhere off. Um, and I also, uh, unlike a, a friend of mine who has a relative that um, was arrested, if you have a relative that was arrested, you can get into the political police archives, but I couldn't. Um, but I was really, really fortunate that a Russian interviewed Tomsky's surviving son. Um, and he provided all sorts of details that allowed me think, to bring him along um, and talk about um, everything from his childhood to uh, extramarital, extramarital affair he had to, to whatever. Um, and um, so that, that uh, really made an enormous difference having access to that. Um, and uh, as far as what I do a biography again, actually I'm kind of addicted a little bit now. Um, <laughs> so I might, uh, it's not gonna be a script like biography, but I'm planning to write about the Stalin's wartime cabinet, um, which includes to be, be a kind of biography of the four other people in the cabinet besides Stalin that everybody's written about. And I, really make the case that they played a critical role and um, especially the fact that the uh, Soviet Union was able to outproduce Germany during the war and, and other aspects of the, of the war effort. Um, so, um, but, I, but uh, I wrote this biography for people with a background in Soviet history. I, I, I just to do it again, maybe try for a viewer of footnotes and <laughs> I'm not a more uh, yeah. popular appeal, but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, it, but it is true that people love biography. biography. My stepmother is in, in a book club that only reads biography. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that is no oops from me for that. But um, so I, I've enjoyed it. I, I, um, I think I'm addressing critical issues about early Soviet history. So it's not just about uh, this particular individual. I do agree that anybody who writes biographies, you can't help but perhaps 
pulled towards exaggerating the importance of, of the person you're writing about and ultimately becoming really sympathetic of, of that person. Um, so I try to keep a, a, a critical eye, but um, but it's that is one of the challenges. Yeah. Um, uh, I didn't realize going in how much he hated Trotsky and how this rivalry between Tomsky and Trotsky was very well known. And people like Judy in graduate school and people in the New Left were all, you know, Trotsky's, uh, Isaac Deutscher's biography of, of, of and Trotsky was like something everybody read. It's kind of this romanticized view of, of Trotsky that I'm not the first person to have a more critical uh, <laughs> take on Trotsky, but. Um, but uh, but I think by writing this, I will not be eligible for the Deutsche Award, which <laughs> is <laughs> <laughs> one of the prizes uh, out there. Yeah. So that's all I'll say right now. <laughs> well, that's a good lead in to me um, because it's, because I'm I'm here um, because my first love as an undergraduate was Russian history. Russian history was what I wanted to do. When I uh, went to graduate school, I learned very quickly that if I didn't speak Russian, that wasn't going to uh, happen. But when I was in college too, uh, Trotsky was my guy. I have learned that that's the bad boyfriend, right? <laughs> let go, let go of, of Trotsky. This book has certainly cured me of my nostalgia for uh, for those college uh, college days. But I want to talk about all the other good uh, non therapeutic things that were uh, that that I liked about this book. I mean, this is really um, a remarkable story, and it's remarkably told. I mean, Charters has given you a sketch of, of uh, Tomsky, Tomsky, not to be confused with Trotsky, just for those of you who don't uh, who who don't know. Um, you know, he's he's both a remarkable character and an entirely plausible one. Um, the chapter on his childhood is really so uh, so well told. It captures the ubiquitous violence of family life in turn of the century Russia, um, family life, workplace life, and the ways in which that bleeds into uh, into politics. At the same time. He captures, I think, wonderfully the pleasures of the autodidact, the person who teaches, teaches himself or uh, or herself. And Tomsky, like lots of other on the uh, on the European left and uh, and elsewhere, is enthralled by reading some of the early classics of socialism. Right, partly because, and actually this is a response to Bill, partly because. There's a theory of society. There's a theory of history. And it's tremendously exciting for a whole generation, for several generations of, uh, of uh, working class folks uh, for, um, for this, uh, this literature. Um, and like many enthusiastic readers in different periods, including the women that I write about in my book who wrote letters to uh, Simone de Beauvoir, they're he, Tomsky, is excited, as were they, by understanding the links between their personal life and these big historical structures. Right? And that really sets him on, uh, on, on fire. And then, like many other European, uh, European radicals, in fact, European radicals since the 18th century, what does he go into? Printing, right? And he becomes a master of orthography. I mean, all of the radicals of 19th century Europe and much of the first half of the 20th century are uh, are in printing. Anyway, so it's a it's a wonderful story and in lots of ways a kind of characteristic one. Uh, so he has smarts and he has ambition and he has an appetite for hard work and he's competent. Those are some of the things that he's got going for him. He's a good speaker. Uh, he certainly, unlike Trotsky, is not handsome. <laughs> he is not handsome. He's short, he's funny looking, and he's funny. <laughs> and he's funny. Our former colleague, Joe Newberger, wise crap to me last night. She's, I know she's up there. I'm, this is for you, Joan, right? He's the Danny DeVito of the Russian. <laughs> <Russian. laughs> <laughs> anyway, as Charters tells us, um, 
uh, Tomsky was the center of a minor cult of personality and enjoyed, enjoyed real popularity and through that real popularity, real influence. So he's a consequential figure and these are incredibly consequential decades, devastatingly so in some cases for the left in Europe, for the battle against Nazism and later on for the developing global South or the developing world in the 1950s and the 1960s for, um, for which the Soviet Union was, again, for better and, and largely for worse, um, a very important model. I really admire the way Charters has told his story. He's worked with tremendously difficult sources. Bill's already talked about that. And David will say a little bit more about it. As you can tell from the footnotes, Hooray for footnotes at the bottom of the page. Um, it gets to you to show off your erudition and Charters has done that. And the literature in Soviet history um, grows exponentially every day. And uh, that being as on top of it as he is, is a tremendous achievement. Um, I also, you know, this is just a kind of love fest for your book, Charters. Uh, he advocates for his guy without hiding his shortcomings. Um, those shortcomings include Tomsky's pleasures with being an important person, capital I, capital P, his taste for good things, which kind of shades into the corruption at points, his drinking, which doesn't set him apart from any of the other <laughs> in, in his circles. Um, Charters lays out Tomsky's defense of trade unions on the one hand, and his eye-popping authoritarianism vis-a-vis -vis actual workers, or at least frequent authoritarianism on the other, including the right to strike. And, and I will just say that my guy, Trotsky, called Tomsky the Sam Gompers of, uh, of the Soviet Union. For many in American history, that wouldn't necessarily be an insult, right? right. You know, yeah. Professor Forbes certainly doesn't consider that an insult. And it's rather hard to imagine Sam Gompers demanding punishment as Tomsky did for workers who don't fulfill trade union um, quotas or castigating quote, drunkards, those who negligently carry out their obligations at work or those who are not punctual at work. He continues, Tomsky again, sounding a little like Trotsky I have to say here, the comradely courts must pass sentences on these slackers, expelling them from work or from the unions and then he says, this is, this is quite telling, I think, about the you know, Bolshevik mindset and the Bolshevik situation. He says, quote, when seven eighths of the workers are fighting for socialism, it is intolerable that one eighth should go against them by striking. That's a kind of chilling and, uh, and tragic uh, moment. Anyway, um, Charters lets us both appreciate Tom, Tomsky's ruthlessness with his political foes, um, which I have to say in the case of Trotsky and Zinoviev seems to me to be tinged with anti-Semitism. And I'm kind of curious what you think of that. That his, his ruthlessness on one hand and his unwillingness or inability to break with the party or check, with, uh, or check Stalin's rise on the other. The seemingly modest title of this book, The Moderate Bolshevik, does a lot of work, and it's worth perhaps saying a little bit more about that. By casting Tomsky as a moderate, Charters is emphasizing the range of policies the Bolsheviks might have pursued, underscoring that there were choices, that there were other routes. Tomsky, for instance, believed in a socialist coalition government instead of the October coup. He defended the new economic policy, opposed labor armies, opposed forced industrialization, opposed collectivization. He was in short an economic incrementalist. He defended inde uh, independent newspapers. And he, I thought this was a little puzzling charter, so you might say a little bit more about it, um, tried to prevent excess bloodshed. Right? And, and you know, at what point that, um, at what point that uh, choice really was uh, was made is uh, is interesting to me. Anyway, with the moderate Bolshevik, uh, it seems to me Charters is also emphasizing the range of temperaments or revolutionary styles, from the steely to the pragmatic to the romantic adventurer, and he shows that 
Tomsky doesn't fit any of those perfectly. Tomsky was not a moderate in intra-party disputes. To the contrary, he was as stubborn and ruthless as the rest of them. And he was not, Charles puts this very uh, clearly, he was not a European style social democrat, not increasingly wedded to constitutional structures. I um, really admire Charter's restraint when speculating about Tomsky's depression. Although I confess to wanting more on Tomsky going to Germany to get psychiatric care in 1934, going to <laughs> Nazi Germany to get psychiatric care. I mean, that's interesting. No, it was before 1934. Was it before? I thought it was. I thought it was. No, no, but no, I think no. it was like 32. Um, somebody's got the book. Somebody's got the book. <laughs> Somebody can look at it. Because I, yeah, I, I wrote that as 1934 and I said, whoa. Yeah, no, that would be whoa. That would be whoa, right? Oh, oh yeah, Gorky's still in fascist Italy. Oh, I know. Gorky, there's the other, uh, really, another Gork, another hero falls. Gorky, <laughs> all right, all right. Gor Gorky is in Sorrento. Sorry, you guys don't necessarily know who Gorky is, but anyway, you know, there he is in fascist Italy, and then he comes back and becomes a sort of Stalinist apologist. Never mind. Um, all right. Uh, I admire that Charters doesn't try to imagine Tomsky's inner world. And there, of course, there are lots of theories that biographers can draw on. And Charters is pretty restrained about not going there. And although he calls Tomsky a tragic hero, he doesn't take refuge in any of the all too familiar tropes and tales of tragic herodom. Moments or visions of greatness, the tragic flaws of either indecision or hubris, and the ineluctable forces of fate pulling him towards the end. You don't go there, and I really admire that. And in fact, the last chapter is really stunning in that respect. We know from the beginning of the book where this is going, but Tomsky makes so many comebacks. He hangs in for such a long time. This last chapter has so many excellent set pieces the world of publishing and you know if one has european friends you know they have volumes and volumes and volumes of social theory that was cranked out by the by these uh, by these soviet uh, presses um, the connections with gorky the ryutin i don't know if i pronounced pronounce that right opposition memos Stalin cackling that his opponents are terrified by cockroaches merely stirring in the walls meetings at dachas whispering while hunting in the woods, Stalin's wife shooting herself. I didn't even know about that. Um, the charges that Tomsky's repentance was not sufficiently sincere, not Bolshevik enough, and the chilling comment, I can't remember who said it, that Tomsky had to, quote, understand our psychology and needs in making his repentance. So this chapter doesn't read like the inexorable fall Perhaps it is, but like many others, I'm so used to reading it in telescoped form that Stalin's hesitations, the extent of support for Tomsky, the willingness of so many to express that support, the redacting of the report on his political mistakes, and actually the long reluctance to purge him, all of that was especially striking to me. And so one question the book raises, if I can just go back to, you know, really broad, broad uh, simple questions is, what does Tomsky's ability to hang in for so long tell us about the Soviet state? Is it, is it that there is play in the joints? Is it about the, um, the, the complicated decisions that have to be made and the effort to keep open uh, lots of different possibilities? And how, you know, I know this is a this is predictable, but I still think it's interesting, and I suspect it's interesting uh, here. How does your version of the Soviet state compare with the Nazi state, right? In terms of bureaucratic structures, um, personal and political interactions, bureaucratic competition, uh, and so forth and so on. All right, so that's my um, that's my question as European is. Let me pull back once more for for Normandy. All right, um, 
we've always loved talking about darkness at noon. I like talking about darkness at noon with the students as much as, uh, as you do. And darkness at noon pits an idealistic and weary Marxist against a resentful worker determined to overcome backwardness. And Rubashov's Marxism is at once too liberal and too dogmatic to withstand the Stalinist assault. But Rubashov is also haunted by his crimes, his treacheries, and his betrayals. Is Tomsky anywhere in darkness at me? That's my question for you. Or for the or for the uh, or for the moment. And I'll stop there. Okay, well, thank you. Sure. Lovely comment. Um, uh, he doesn't have blood on his hands in the same way that Rubashov did. He wasn't involved in the Civil War. He, um, uh, I don't know that he betrayed people in the same sort of way that Rubashov does in Germany. Um, people always ask me after our class discussion, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Rubashov. I, I thought sure. you asked them that. Well, they have to write about it. They have to write about that, but then they always want to know what I think. <laughs> I make them wait for the end of this of the class, and I ask them uh, often to guess, and they're not sure. Um, but I am sympathetic to Rubashov, um, partly for the same reason as as Tomsky. I mean, he devoted his entire life to the party. Um, for Tomsky to devote his entire life to the party, and then the party to turn on him, equate him with a with a fascist. Um, with fascism or what have you. Um, he refuses um, to do the kind of last service to the party that Rubishov does by going through this with this interrogation and then make a public confession of blue, um, ridiculous charges. He was smart in knowing that was where it was going. Um, he put suicide in the summer of 1936 before the, um, the purge did really get going. It was following the very first short trial of Zenobia, who you brought up, and, and Kamenev. Uh, and, and some others. Um, but, uh, and Bukharin and Rikov is the other two leading figures in the, of the so-called right opposition don't. Um, they, re they confess to their loved ones that they regretted it, that we should have followed Tomsky's advice. Um, Bukharin writes pleading letters to Stalin asking for forgiveness, as, as, as you know. Um, but, uh, um, so Tomsky makes this decisive decision um, to, to kill himself. Um, but as I noted in my comments, I mean, his family, it still suffers as a result. I mean, it was yeah, brutal in the yeah. Nazi way. I mean, these are, these are just his children who obviously weren't involved in any oppositional activity, but for no other reason, were both executed and basically everybody who we worked with in the trade unions or as head of the publishing industry were ultimately be tracked down during the great purchase. Um, so it's a, it's um, a brutal regime. Um, just to some of uh, Judy's comments, um, he was very impressively an autodidact. I mean, he he read endlessly. I mean, and for many of these revolutionaries, being in in prison was a, kind of this university. Um, they can you know read. Um, all the liberal publishing houses provided free books to the prisoner political prisoners. Um, he started to learn English because he was interacting with British uh, trade unionists. Um, so he's, um, but he's still um, just really good at billiards. He loved hunting. <laughs> I mean, he, he, you know, some of the things that, that Judy was, was referring to. He certainly liked drinking, um, but he did um, suffer from serious physical ailments. Um, uh, he was a printer, as Judy mentioned, but that meant feeling all these toxic chemicals. Um, he then is sent off to, to prison where the conditions are really bad and ultimately to Siberia. Um, and uh, these various physical ailments um, uh, clearly took a toll on him. He wasn't initially depressed at all. I mean, people were always um, fascinated with how cheerful he seemed to be and how he always tried to lift people's spirits. And he does seem to be this Kind of charming, funny guy that could um, that had a lot of popular appeal, despite, as Judy said, not being a particularly attractive guy. Um, he is only five foot three. Um, uh, Bukhar is not even five foot tall. I mean, these guys are really all really pretty short. I mean, 
Dawn's only five six. Um, really? Yeah. Judy, how tall is Trask? <laughs> I'm sure he's six feet. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <Why> not? <laughs> no, he's the, not the kind of flamboyant character that 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 um, Trotsky is, but he is a a great public speaker. You can't read any of his the transcripts of his various speeches without this insertions of laughter in the stenographic reports. Um, so he he's all that. Um, he uh, you don't know who Sam. Sam Goffers is, and I, I guess you didn't feel the need to tell them, but he's a, of the, one of the initial heads of the AFL-CIO, American trade unionism, and Petrosky accused him of being basically American trade unionist. It was a biting insult, um, and, and Petrosky seemed to enjoy insult. Um, and, uh, you know, and people like Petrosky would want to get back at him, and, and, and sadly, it would make him blind to the dangers that aligning himself with, with Stalin would provide. Um, but he's a, he's a household friend of, of Stalin. Um, his wife, I mean, Stalin got really upset after the um, last will of, of Lenin. She would console him. I mean, um, and again, this thanks to this, um, this interview and this memoir of, of uh, Tomsky's son, um uh we should let David yeah yes yeah, yeah uh, uh, I think you come back to any other questions well I'll keep it short um you know being being the last um has its benefits and its drawbacks the benefits are that uh, there are all sorts of um topics and themes and, and and issues that I can bounce off of that have come up both from Bill and from Judy and as you can see from my notes, the the drawbacks have had to cut out most of it. Full disclosure: I have never written a biography. Ten years ago, I stumbled, little really stumbled across an amazing personal archive of a German war photographer um, who worked for the Nazis and then had a career after 1945 in post-war West Germany journalism. I have written ninety thousand words on this. And I have canned the project because of several reasons. <laughs> Number one, even though you have great sources, you hate the guy. Um, <laughs> and I do not understand how Ian Kershaw has, for his career, written uh, many volumes on, on Hitler, who is the ultimate yeah. hate object. Um, but you know, more to the point also was that I, I, I realized that what I wanted to do in the next phase of my writing he couldn't help me with, so he's getting one chapter of his book, and that's it. But to come back uh, to, to Charters, uh, first of all, I'm just so impressed by this book. I think it's an impressive achievement, and in at least for me, two different ways. Number one, as a biography, if you want to call it this, but I think you do so much more than, I mean, it's a biography in context and situ, and there are all these conversations that are going on between him and all these other people. Um, it you know he did come alive for me, and that's an amazing achievement, given that you don't have what the Germans like to call ego documents, like no letters, no diaries. Being able to pull this off is is just a real testament to how um, successful the book is. But then, at an, at another level, I think it's an impressive achievement because you know. I, 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 I'm of the generation that we were all weaned on Isaac Deutscher. So, you know, the, <laughs> the, 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 the fight that mattered was between um, Stalin and Trotsky. And this book made me think, oh, you know, there are some other people involved with this, some other possibilities. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump around a bit here, but I, I want to go to um, a couple of, of quotes is that I, I was struck in. Um, J. Arch Getty's um, review of your book that he says, Tomsky was, quote, arguably at least as important as Bukharin and Trotsky, but until now, no major biography of Tomsky um, has been alluded <laughs> to that in your comments. And it just, I mean, you've convinced me of how, as a possible alternative, how important he could have been. I'll come back to that, could have been part of it. But um, so it, it why has he not gotten attention before? Um, 
you know, I mean, you, you go some way to answer that in your book, but I'd just like to hear more about it. And then that um, sort of spins over, spills over into, I'd like to hear a bit more, uh, if you can, about his reputation after Stalin, and particularly from Khrushchev onward. Did, did he, was he rehabilitated? Did he make it, um, did he have a higher profile, or has it, you know, really continued to the present? Um, now I want to just dig down into this because I think, look, you know, for me, um, the most fascinating part of the book is the big what if question that it raises. You know, if Tom Tomsky had, instead of Stalin, had become general secretary of the party and taken control, how would that have changed history, world history? How would that have changed the Soviet Union? Um, how would it have been different? In, in what different ways do you think? I mean, if you start to say this is what it could not have been, but what would it have been? Insofar as you can talk about that piece. Now, as a German historian, I can't let Hitler get away. Hitler's in the picture. Um, what I was struck by is whatever parallels you might make, after 1934, there was no alternative to Hitler, no one within the, you know, the party was going to challenge Hitler, replace Hitler. There was no, there was no opposition to Hitler until uh, June of 1944 in the um, attempt to, to kill Hitler. When things were going so badly, there didn't much other kind of a choice. But that does, that also to, to underlines and emphasizes to me that what you're, you're opening up here is um, this, this realm of possibility. That there were other possibilities, that there were other, that Stalin was not inevitable. And I, I, I guess what I'm asking is if you could just sort of flesh that out a bit more, especially with, with regard to um, this question. What was, was Tomsky's biggest mistake? What did, what did he do that he could have done otherwise? And I love that you started the book, I think it's at the very beginning, with um, the quote that he. Um, says to his 15 year old son just before what a, a great thing to say just before deciding to grab one of his guns and shoot yeah. himself that's right. all that's yeah. it that's <laughs> i can't yeah. i can't live without the party right? yeah and i i just think that that is a wonderful way to begin the book and it just opens all opens up all of these these questions about what did that mean for him um and i want to connect that to a statement you make at the very end of the book, this is on page 388, um, his refusal to, to, quote here, tap the formidable political power of the nearly 100,000 trade union administrators strategically located in all industrial centers, even though Tomsky and his fellow right deviations accurately predicted the Stalinist plan for a breakneck education <laughs> and forced collectivization with like catastrophic results. They continue to refuse to make their opposition public and appeal for support. So it's that, you know, conundrum of they can see what is going to happen, but they won't do anything. I mean, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It seems that, they, that that's it. So if you can just sort of, you know, dig down into that a bit, you know, that's really fascinating to me. Okay. Yeah. Again, thank you, David, um, for your for your comments. Um, so the book is entitled The Modern Bolshevik. It's not the modern. Right. In Russia <laughs> or something right. like that. Right. Exactly. Uh, so he was a Bolshevik. And for Bolsheviks to go public with their opposition, to appeal to the part to the population, would runs the risk of, of creating a civil war. And that was his mentality. That was the mentality shared by, by others. Trotsky makes this, you know big sin of trying to organize a popular opposition. They demonstrate um, the anniversary of the revolution going through Red Square, um, but it's squashed. And Tomsky, to his, his credit, plays a key role in, in squashing. It was just part of the ethos of, of the party that you, you, you not go outside the party, assuming um, uh, maybe not even outside the, the top echelon of the party. Um, but I think in terms of the question of what if, um, yeah, I mean, it was close to, it wasn't like this was, he was doomed from the start. There was, in the Politburo of seven members, 
comes uh, nine in, in uh, later in the 1920s. Um, they they just lose because a couple of people side with Stalin, um, and that everything's being decided within this tight inner circle. Um, but yeah, if, there, if Tomsky had prevailed or Karn had prevailed, um, it's a lot of what wouldn't have happened. Um, they were staunchly opposed to collectivization, the, the horrors of decolonization that the Normandy students are all familiar with, um, the famine that followed. Um, there are some in, uh, uh, that argue that though it was the command economy, the five-year plans that Stalin created that ultimately allowed um, the Soviet Union to defeat Germany. But um, so I, you know, so there, that's kind of a counter to Tomsky that you know, it was fortunate for the Soviet Union that they went through these hardships. But yeah, alienating most of the population as, as Stalin did um, uh, also meant there were all these people willing to collaborate. And Hitler hadn't been so unbelievably horrible. Um, you know, the, um, he could have easily uh, defeated the, the Soviet Union because people weren't willing to fight for this regime, um, arguably. Um, so I, I do think he um, provides an alternative. Stalinism yeah. was one logical outcome of the revolution, but I, I think a more moderate policy would, was as well. Um, why there has been no attention to him, um, Stephen Cohen, a, a historian at uh, Princeton University in the, in the late 1970s, wrote a very, very influential book about the car. And that people kind of felt like, well, that's all we need to know about the, the right off the bridge. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but it is a little stunning to me. Um, as you read accounts, that he's nowhere to be seen. Um, as was noted, in, you know, our whole graduate course, I mean, he, maybe at some footnotes, um, but, um, but he, uh, uh, I think, you know, was really influential. Doesn't, uh, and there were parts of his life I had no idea about. Then he was sent off to Central Asia. It, there's no mention of that anywhere in, um, uh, in bio, you know, these short little encyclopedic, you know, references to, to, um, to Tomsky. Tomsky. Um, so, um, so, uh, so he really has been neglected. And I tried to make the case for why that was a, a problem. And I really do try to put him in the context of these major issues that are evolving in, in, during this first decade of the Soviet Union. And I do think this last chapter, but say so, it's, it's really kind of rich. I mean, to just, yeah. you know, to see him, um, just being hounded and um, thinking into depression, but still, whenever he can pull himself together, mm -hmm. um, you know, work really hard. And why he wasn't gotten rid of earlier, one of you were asking, is because he was just a really good administrator, and they didn't have that many of them. Uh, and so he was head of the publishing industry, some thirty-six thousand employees, um, and while uh, uh, you know, firmly entrenched the power. Um, once you get into the early 30s, Stalin doesn't have the power that Hitler would have or that he would have later, but it was already um, pretty impossible for mm -hmm. any kind of serious opposition. But there was real opposition during the, during the 20s. Um, but I'd like to open it up to um, people in the audience who might have any questions that I could address. Yeah, well, I do. Uh, I do have a question. Um, I'm approaching the humility of all the like, work that you've done. It's really impressive. Um, something that came up when Dr. Brands was talking about like, why people don't like history class, like I feel like a lot of it has to do with that, like people don't really feel, specifically myself, that a lot of histories that you learn in school aren't really for you, that there's not space for you. I feel really brought into the fold of this program because of a lot of the things that we learn are so outside of my existence. Um, and I have, wonderful professors who really care about making, being intentional and making me feel a part of the fold. Um, and so I really wanted to ask you, like, when you were writing this, did you, this book make you interrogate aspects of your own identity? And as a historian, do you feel like you have a duty to bring other people who are like me that may feel outside of the fold? Because I do feel like as a historian, you kind of have a superpower in placing 
an important on sectors of history that people may not know about. I mean, I, like you said, never forget. How could I forget Tomsky if I didn't know about <laughs> Well, um, you guys have identified with him. You identified with him, or like, did you feel like when you were writing about him and about who he was, did that make you like interrogate aspects of yourself, or did you like, did anything call out to you? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, but on that, on the other, the other issue of not, people not being included, I mean, Judy asked if he was anti Semitic. Um, so many of the top party officials were Jewish, unlike the majority of the party. Um, that when he goes into, you know, he's fighting Trotsky or Zinoviev, um, maybe there is an element of anti Semitism in that. Um, I've never seen him say anything directly anti Semitic. But when he was talking, when he was in Central Asia, he would say really disparaging things about about the Central Asia. They, they don't like to work hard. They're lazy, um, uh, and uh, so uh, so this is a story about a white man and you know kind of, kind of, kind of traditional history of you know so called great. <laughs> But he is head of this union that includes all these uh, people of different nationalities and um, to some extent is, is trying to address that. Um, I don't know that I so identified with him or uh, that I, I mean, so was so sympathetic to him that I really identified with him. But um, I could, I certainly tried to convey just how torturous um, the treatment that he received was. Best yeah. So going back to kind of you guys' discussion of writing biography. Um, so uh, for those writing biographies of Trotsky, it's relatively easy because he went off to Spain and then to Mexico, I went, and he met lots of people and they wrote about him and so on. And what you were saying is that everyone Tomsky worked with, everyone he knew was hunted down and killed. But does that Create uh, a problem for the biographer in that, like, if, if no, <laughs> even if he worked with yeah. people at the time, thought he was super important, they didn't have time to write it down before they went into the gulag. Yeah, a good point. Um, so, uh, Trotsky is a big writer, and a lot of the, and Lenin was a big, so he wrote endlessly. Um, Trotsky basically yeah. worked, writes a memoir, um, and that's kind of a kind of source that, that I don't have. Deutscher, who we talked about before, his uh, Trotsky's wife gave him an exclusive access to Trotsky's papers at the, at the Harvard Library. So he had this, you know, volumes of, of correspondence and all sorts of things. Part of the kind of Bolshevik ethos was to not really talk about yourself in the same sort of way that um, would, would help the biographer. Um, uh, but even so, it was certainly a challenge that I didn't have the kind of letters and things that as Professor Moran or Bill said was very just kind of critical for writing a biography. If the, you don't have sources, if the youngest son had been killed too, would yeah, anything work with him? Yeah, no, that would have been a real problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> His youngest son, unbelievably, dates. Stalin's daughter after she released <laughs> from the from the, from the <laughs> but but then he dumps her because she's always um he's making fun of the bad clothes he has. I mean uh I saw in her not the sweet pigtail girl we went to summer camp with, but the you know, reflection of her father. Um, uh, but uh, so there were so the, this uh, kind of family folklore that, that I don't use uncritically, but um, it's hard to resist sometimes. Uh, uh, some of these um, family stories uh, that um, his youngest son Yuri um, provided. It, Yuri died before I could have had an opportunity to interview him, but um, thanks to this guy, uh, Oleg. Gork Gorelov um, intended to write a biography of him, and ultimately does, but um, but it, it, it's not 
it, in some ways not a serious academic study, but um, with various interviews with people. Yeah. Yes, sir. So you mentioned how you would, uh, you waited a long time to finish the book because you were hoping that these archives would open up. And so I was just wanted to ask, like, what specific or were there specific like insights you were hoping to get that you didn't get or details? That kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have known more about um, his thoughts about being head of the publishing industry, for example. Um, I think that that later part of his life, he would have, I know he had various exchanges because he had to write to various people. Um, but in the end, I, I, I felt I you know, was able to get a pretty good handle on every key aspect of his life. Um, uh, part of it is he, he was um, really able to charm these British trade unions um, uh, who were a little bit towards Tomsky, like they might have been towards Trotsky. You know, they, they welcomed him, he made me feel young again because, you know, um, you know, you got this revolutionary spirit that he invited them to, to um, his dacha outside Moscow where he barbecue shish kebabs uh, for them. <laughs> and uh, they talk about it. So in addition to, um, it's it's not just only his son, but the son I think is really critical, but um, but various people that he interacted with do, do talk about him, and especially some of these British trade unions. Even when he's totally on the outs and they don't want to let um, anyone see these foreigners see um, Tomsky, they insist and they ultimately do see him. Um, and he can put on a pretty good face in some of these inter inter interactions because um, <laughs> he was already, by this point, pretty depressed, but um, they, they did pick that up, up on that. Yeah. Thoughts or questions? Chan, oh yeah, yeah, Hi, Chan. Um, yeah. With my very limited knowledge on Soviet history, I was just wondering. Um, I guess it it's fairly obvious to me that there is kind of like a cult of personality that surrounds Trotsky, even to today. Um, but I guess I was just wondering, like, what exactly, um, I guess, prevented that, or if, I mean, I guess to ask if there kind of was that sense of um, affinity or following within the Soviet Union for Trotsky, and it seems like. My understanding, it, it seems like he might have obviously kind of inhabited this administrator role very well, and maybe in a way that, like, you know, I feel like maybe like Trotsky stay power and a lot of these other kind of like people who are considered canon in Soviet history um, were kind of more ideologues and, um, you know, produced, um, I don't know, like theory or, you know, so I guess just, um, I just wanted to know about kind of his lack of following. Well, that was seen as as a as a lack among the Soviet leaders that he was not a theorist. You're supposed to be a theorist. Um, he liked to compliment himself, saying, "You know, I have horse sense, I have, uh, common sense." Um, but he does write a lot. Um, there were four volumes of his collected works, are supposed to be future ones, but once he was on the outs, that was suddenly cut off. Um, uh, uh, there was a cult of, of Tomsky. Um, there's a ship named after him. There was a stadium <laughs> named after him. The trade union's higher school was named after him. Um, but, uh, but ultimately, Stalin you know, squeezes all of that away. He he's not really rehabilitated, as um, as you were asking. I mean, he uh, ultimately under Gorbachev he. He, he is, but it's not until then. Um, it's Bukharin, who was a theorist, who the Euro communists of the of the seventies are kind of gravitating toward. Um, uh, so, it, um, but I also really come down pretty hard on Bukharin. I mean, he would just makes one political stupid mistake after another, and um, you know, Tomsky's linked with him, and uh, kind of is always trying to cover up for, for Bukharin's of various mistakes. You don't say in 1920s Soviet Russia to, to peasants, enrich yourselves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bukharin does. Um, but 
but uh, but yeah, Tomsky could be vicious in these um, party um, in this party struggle, um, uh, and uh, why why he doesn't act more effectively later is partly because he knows that he's said these things towards other oppositionists that you know make him seem hypocritical of, uh, if, if nothing worse for, for trying to do exactly the same thing later. Mm -hmm. um, but there were points where um, there was a, a movement um, how widespread to have Tomsky replace Stalin. Um, doesn't come to anything, but it's part of the um, confessions of people in the in the show trials in Moscow was that they were we were planning a palace coup with and putting Tomsky in. Um, uh, and it infuriates Stalin that, that Tomsky has killed himself. And you know, mm -hmm. doesn't even put him through the kind of torture that uh, all the other party leaders were, were forced to endure. Do we believe what they say at the show trials? I mean, if they say we were plotting files, but we were going to put Tomsky in there, do we believe them? Or are they saying that because Tomsky's dead and, and we can't tell them? I think there's a kernel of truth in a lot of uh -huh. these confessions. Uh -huh. um, uh, so to what extent is hard, hard to right. know. But it's, it, it, uh, we do have, for example, Bukharin's kind of interrogation of when he's first arrested. Right. Um, not when he's in the show trial, and he does confess to somebody. He throws saying, everyone under the bus. Yeah, does he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, because I wrote that biography well, right, of Bukhar, and then I thought, okay, so he, not Trotsky, then maybe Bukhar was the anti Stalin. Yeah. He comes off really bad with it. That last chapter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh Andrew. Um, it seems like you've got this kind of like dichotomy between him being a very good public speaker, like lighthearted, makes people laugh, and being like doctrinaire Bolshevik, like you keep it within the party and you're very disciplined. What I'm just curious, like you're talking about these transcripts where there's laughter and there's jokes. If he's a Bolshevik and he's set and he's believing in himself, like never criticize the party, never criticize the system, mm -hmm. never you know, like, never, like, make fun of, of you know, your comrades, yet, like, what was he joking about? What was right. it? Well, you can criticize other people. I mean, uh, so, yeah, you can't, even in the 20s, you could criticize a lot of things. Um, he makes fun of, uh, uh, um, I remember the um, at various points, uh, other figures um, uh, compares Kanye um, wanting to uh, return to the party to uh, like these uh, gorillas in Central Asia and how they would want to be welcomed back into their ranks uh, because they uh, their horses were starving. But once once spring came, they would all. Um, uh, take up arms against the uh, Soviets as, as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know that he's that funny. <laughs> but he, he just um, has a lot of little jokes he would, he would make um, about, um, even to these British trade unionists, uh, about um, party figures. Um, but uh, I don't know. The book um, is a Extraordinarily expensive right now, um, but in on um, May second, for anyone who might be interested, there's going to be a paperback edition um, for thirty five dollars more, more reasonable. Um, but uh, um, it's free on the library website. Uh, yeah. Yes. But uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering if there was kind of a definitive moment or source or piece of evidence that made you. Interested or kind of realized that Tomsky was kind of worth a, you know, like a full form biography, or if it was just kind of a culmination of, you know, seeing footnotes and seeing kind of like his like maybe fingerprints or imprints on certain aspects of Soviet history that you felt like had been examined enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I originally wasn't planning on writing a biography. I mean, I was trained as a social historian. Um, my first book is the social political history of the region, but when I 
Well, I, we were hired here, Joe Newberger and myself. Uh, kind of the understanding was I've become a Soviet historian. I mean, we both worked on, um, on the pre-revolutionary period. And I was going to write it, some sort of labor history of the 1920s. But I, as I started looking at it, like everywhere I would turn, there would be Tomsky. Um, and, uh, and there's also uh, <laughs> a historian that we read, Richard Pipes, um, a very conservative historian. Um, at Harvard University, um, praised my first book, um, but that I was a courageous young historian um, uh, for deromanticizing the workers. Um, but he then goes on to say, isn't it interesting that all these labor historians talk about workers, um, but don't actually write about individual workers. Um, and to some extent, I always kind of took that as a little bit of a challenge. Um, um, could you really write about you know, one of these so-called conscious workers in a, in a way that goes beyond um, this more general histories of the, the period? Um, uh, but it just it increasingly became apparent to me that, that Tomsky was playing a far more important role than anyone appreciated. Um, and then how to frame it. So. Uh, on the face of it, this title, The Modern Bolshevik, or maybe a moderate Bolshevik, is kind of a uh, oxymoron. I mean, you can't be a, a, a Bolshevik and still be modern. Um, <laughs> but I really want to, I really insist that during the 20s, there was a real range of, of views, um, and uh, as you were talking about, and that um, there was real debate, and the Paul had real debates. It wasn't um, just you know Stalin deciding everything or Lenin deciding everything. Um, and it was striking to me that, that even with Lenin, that Tomsky would often be very critical of him. Um, and, um, and that even over his objections, he's made you know, members of, of the Politburo. So, um, but uh, it just kind of started moving from a kind of history of the 20s to, to, a, to a biography, it seemed like a a way to get a little deeper into the period. But he is against strikes, as you pointed out. Um, so it, uh, he's always, he has these dual responsibilities, as I pointed out in the, in the beginning. And how to, yeah, he wants the Soviet Union to advance industrially. It needs to become more productive. I mean, things are just at the bottom in 1921 uh, after the, the policies of the, of the Civil War. And so he's, Improving conditions for workers, but also, you know, no tolerance for for slackers or for for others. And labor discipline was a real problem. I mean, uh, people were drinking on the job, dealing with the factories. I mean, there was things that kind of really broken down as a result of the revolution. And um, he's playing a role in trying to to counter that. Um, but he's pushing back against the managers of these factories. Workers are getting these vacations and going to resorts and things that are getting a lot better. It's kind of a, of a golden age um, in, in some ways, given what preceded it and then, of course, what under, under um, But to, to uh, David's point about what, how it would have been different, I mean, it, it wouldn't have been mass arrests of, of people or wouldn't have been. Um, or, you know, round, rounding up of so-called kulaks, rich peasants, and sending them off to who knows where, millions sent off to the, to the gulags. Um, 700,000 people executed in, in 1937, 1938. I mean, none of that would have, would have happened. Um, so it would have been a more humane um, form of, of, of socialism rather than the, the model that, we, that so many countries adopt after Stalin's success um, that is based on with the Soviet under Stalin. Do you think it would have been like any future ever? Well, I mean, Lenin even says it's, we've adopted this policy seriously and for a long time. <laughs> he talked about 20 years um, uh, before we could. I mean, there, everybody's goal was always to uh, ultimately collectivize, um, but, um, but, uh, but I think it could have been NEP coming World War II. And then what would have happened? Well, thank you all for coming. And some of you were.
jaws twisted. <laughs> Strongly encouraged. We are glad to have you all. Yeah. Well, congratulations. <laughs>